Welcome to Unrestricted. I'm your host, Athena Simpson. I'm a serial entrepreneur and life and business optimization coach and educator who helps women uncover their superpowers so they can thrive at life and work without compromise. I want you to have an unfiltered view into the reality of transformation with clear, tangible takeaways that you can apply to your life and career or business to help you get more unrestricted. So put your phone into do not disturb, minimize any distractions, and let's dive into today's episode. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Unrestricted Live. Today, I am bringing back an exploration that I made a few months ago into FOBO, fear of a better option. And in this episode, I'm going to be talking about when decision-making and feminine energy collide, what is FOBO and how to create space for uncertainty. I'm going to get a little woo-woo on you. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to talk about masculine and feminine energies and how we can create space for us to feel safe going out into the realm of uncertainty. So strap in. You are in for a uncertain decision-making ride. FOMO, the fear of missing out. It's the anxiety we get when we are worried we'll miss something amazing if we don't show up to our friend's party. I've enlisted the help of JOMO to counter FOMO, the joy of missing out, or rather the joy I'll experience by listening to myself and know that I actually just want a chill night in rather than a big social event. Very rarely do I regret choosing JOMO over going to something that wasn't a fuck yes for me. We are increasingly faced with more decisions than ever before. The internet has opened us up to literally every decision on the planet. And because of that, we feel increasing pressure to make the right decision. There's been a number of tools I've had to implement to reduce my decisions. One has been intuition. I started employing the, if it isn't a fuck yes, it's a hell no method. When faced with the decision, I would listen to my body and see how she was feeling. What came up? That worked for a while until I realized that often my resistance to an option was misdirected fear. Our brains are trained to stay in the familiar, which is why when faced with a decision to eat from a place we know and when we don't, our brain will push us towards the known because it is less likely we will die because we've eaten there before and we didn't die. I would fear something to keep myself safe when often behind that fear was the opportunity for fun, expansion, and exploration. I started using this analogy in my work. Behind fear is fun. If you think of almost every fun thing you've done in life, you were probably initially afraid. A few examples in my own life were selling everything and running away to live with a circus collective, starting pole and silks, trying a temescal, which is a sweat lodge ceremony originated in Mexico, despite my fear of enclosed spaces and heat. Each time I was afraid, yet when I pushed through the fear, I got a new enriching experience. I expanded my possibilities and I felt more and more superhuman every time I pushed through the discomfort of the known. Okay, so now I know that often the fuck yes, hell no method isn't always the best guidance, but what about when faced with multiple decisions? I listened to an episode of All the Hacks by Chris Hudgens, where he interviewed Patrick McGinnis, the man that literally created the term FOMO. Enter the term I hadn't heard before, fear of a better option, FOBO. McGinnis shared there are two types of people, maximizers and satisfiers. Maximizers want the absolute best outcome out of every decision. Satisfiers, on the other hand, just seek satisfaction. Maybe it's not the best, but as long as they're satisfied, they're happy. Maximizers often make better decisions, but are less happy because of the anticipated regret of what they didn't choose. Oof, that one hit hard. They pointed out the affluence of having a decision. How Just by having the option of a decision, you are in an affluent situation. If you were literally just trying to survive, you wouldn't have the option to languish on a decision. They use the example of looking for a new job. If you have the option to interview at multiple companies and entertain multiple job offers, you're in a pretty cushy place as opposed to, I literally have to survive, so I'm going to take the first thing that comes my way to do that. Essentially, McGuinness's theory is that we are obstructing our own happiness by focusing on what decision to make. I recently had that experience during my vacation a few weeks ago. I made no plans for the week. And because of that, I was faced with unlimited choices about what to do with my day. I found it stressful and dissatisfying because often I wouldn't do too much because I was just so overwhelmed by all the choice. I shared this in my stand-up comedy set that week because I finally understood what my clients must feel like on a daily basis of choosing to be in flow. 
on any given day, even my days off, I will make a plan or a list of what I want to do that day. It gives me direction, purpose, and a sense of satisfaction when I complete what I wanted to do. Even if it is lie in bed, listening to podcasts and reading all day, by deciding that is what I want to do, I feel good at the end of the day that I did it instead of feeling like I wasted a day. Fun fact, seeing leisure time as wasteful is actually bad for your well-being. Now, most people write to-do lists that they can't actually complete in a day, so it stresses them out. I've perfected my process over the years, and it's something I spend a lot of time teaching my clients to ensure that the list is achievable and actionable. Having a list that's completely crossed off every day feels fucking awesome and limits the choice overload shutdown that can happen when you don't have a plan. So let's get back to FOBO. I still, when faced with certain types of choices, can end up getting lost for hours looking for the best option. Take, for example, when I was in Panama during lockdown in 2020, hoping to get out into Tulum as soon as the flight ban was lifted. Multiple times, I would spend hours looking at Airbnbs, trying to figure out what the perfect combination of variables would be for the place I would stay for two weeks before finding my long-term place. The flight ban got extended every month for six months, and all of that research I did would end up being useless. Those places I saved might not be available, and I honestly actually didn't know when I'd be able to leave. The process ended up stressing me out because it reminded me of the powerless situation I was in, but also I would have to start all over again when my flight was rebooked. McGinnis said, when making decisions, we should look at them in three different categories, high stakes, low stakes, and no stakes. Once we know the category, then we can employ a process to limit the time we waste on making these decisions. But in order for this process to work, we must also reframe our thinking to that of the satisfier. We should seek to be satisfied with an experience rather than thinking about what we could be missing out on. No stakes decisions are those you won't remember in a few hours or days. Things like what item to pick off the menu or what to watch on Netflix. God knows how many hours of wasted just trying to decide what to watch instead of just picking something. He says to outsource these decisions to an object, flip a coin or close your eyes and point. Chances are your satisfaction from the outcome will be about the same no matter what you eat or watch. Low stakes decisions are those that you'll forget in a few days or weeks. Things like picking an Airbnb, for example, there's really no way of knowing what the experience will be until you get somewhere. In my case, I could have waited until I actually knew I was getting on a plane and then pick something that looked good enough. As long as it had the amenities I wanted, chances were my experience would be about the same no matter what I chose. In these situations, he suggests outsourcing to a person. If you're shopping for a new item, do you have a friend you can ask for a recommendation? While you might not always have a friend, I will often search for comparison recommendations online. There's bound to be somebody ridiculously interested in this stuff that will have done far more research and testing than me. Frankly, I don't often have interest in learning about something that in-depth. Recently, I looked at a new podcast filming platform. After an hour of researching, I decided to just stick with what I knew. Sure, maybe the sound quality might be better, but the cost, the time to learn a new platform, and the unknowns weren't something I wanted to mess around with. But that pesky FOBO. I'd heard about podcast filming sites and got worried that the tried and tested option I was using wasn't good enough and spent time focusing on that instead of something else that could be more enriching, fun, or relaxing. High stakes decisions are those that do have longer term ramifications. Choosing a house to buy or a job to take. For those of you that are thinking about starting a business, this can be a real asshole to deal with. When faced with these types of decisions, McGinnis suggests focusing on three things to make your decision. Number one, what things really matter to you. Number two, gather the facts. And number three, whittle down your options and compare your front runner to each of the options one at a time and take away an option each time. This process should leave you with an obvious winner, but if it doesn't, go to a trusted group of advisors to help you make the decision. You can watch him explain the whole process by clicking on the link in the show notes. I found this type of content particularly relevant when I was coming up on a year of taking my first client with Unrestricted and was deciding which direction I wanted to take the project. It was an interesting exploration, one that had ultimately been guided by my intuition and something I'd not allowed myself to do in past ventures. I was crippled by FOBO, however. There's a level of uncertainty with creativity that I have denied myself in the past in pursuit of perfection. I am a recovering perfectionist, which is a daily practice in itself but I have felt myself more and more pulled to the mediums that light me up. Writing and podcasting, although I view podcasting as radio, having started my first radio show in 1999, I fell in love with the medium and seem to keep returning to it. While I have absolute certainty that I love these forms of expression, there are unknowns about whether they will work for my business or not. But more and more I get signs I should push on, perhaps because my desire is priming me for external validation. After listening to Tim Ferriss's podcast about building his podcast to 700 million, also with Chris Hutchins, 
I came away resolute that I wanted to create again through writing and podcasting. So here we are, dear listener. I've recorded multiple podcast episodes and I'm so fired up from every conversation. I'm literally bursting with excitement to share these stories of women who quit their jobs and went into exploration of their own happiness, started businesses and grew them to six figures and beyond. All the tips and tricks that I've learned along the way around optimizing and feeling our best and getting unrestricted, as well as talking with women a little bit more in depth about their experience living unrestricted lives. Allow me to get woo woo for a moment. I've been focusing on how to be more in my feminine energy and put a big focus on diving into that, not only in relationships, but in my life. Feminine energy is creativity. It's exploration, fun, and uncertainty. It's focusing on feeling good despite knowing what will materialize. Every time I get too focused on goals, outcomes, and structure without allowing myself creative license to play, I get a reminder from the universe that in the void of uncertainty is fun and often a reward I didn't fathom. Now, that's not to say that structure and masculine energy isn't incredibly important in the day-to-day. -day. I find that creating a stable framework for how I live my life and build my business allows my feminine to feel safe to explore. What the fuck are you talking about, Athena? Okay, let's talk about routines. When you create a structure for your basic needs, our desirable habits are then on autopilot. That then creates space for you to explore. In my daily life, I have a morning routine that I do every day without fail that also incorporates time for sitting outside, watching the birds and butterflies before meditating. I write out my to-do list and my daily list always includes nourishing activities and or space for free time and play. Go to silks, go to pole, go to the beach. These go on my list. And then when I'm in the activity, I explore and I do whatever my heart wants. But, and the big but, I feel able to let go more fully to these experiences because I consciously created that space in my schedule and know I completed what I wanted to do that day. I decided what I wanted to do before and after that space to explore, so I'm not stressing about all the things I should be doing. I can decide I'm going to take a two hour break in the middle of the day to go dance on silks because I created the structure and safety for that exploration. I purposely build free time into my day. There's a balance. Without structure, we can't feel safe to explore. There's even been psychological studies of children who were more adventurous based on their attachment styles, i.e. did they feel safe? For now, it's important to point out that when we feel safe, we can also feel brave. So creating our own safety, then learning what we need and desire to feel safe enough to go out into the unknown is the holy grail. When we take care of our body and our mind, have a solid process for making decisions, cultivate our days, lives, and businesses to ultimately align with what it is that will make us happy, we build strength to push past the comfort of staying safe and go explore which in actual fact are staying safe behaviors often torture us because we repeat old patterns and we do not change things that are draining us. It's the underpinning of the work I do with unrestricted. If you aren't in control of your life, someone or something else is. So let me leave some takeaways for you. Start bringing consciousness to your decision-making process. Are you a maximizer or a satisfier? And which one would you rather be? Can you start to outsource some of the low or no risk decisions to something or someone else? And if you're still ruminating on a decision, think of the absolutely worst case scenario. It probably doesn't justify the amount of headspace that you're giving it. For those of you that are wanting to start a business, I often say the worst thing that will happen if it doesn't work out is that you have to get a job again. Poor you. But you'll have done something most people won't be brave enough to do, and you'll have experience and knowledge that will support you if you want to try again. And lastly, how can you systemize and automate aspects of your day or decision-making that will allow you free time to go and explore? If you don't yet have a morning routine, you can check out my video with tips and tricks. I'll leave the link in the show note. So that's it for today. Something for you to ponder is the fear of a better option and how that might be disrupting your life. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed today's episode, please take a minute to leave a review or give me a little shout out on Instagram at athena.simpson. If you'd like more content from me on getting unrestricted, sign up for my newsletter where you'll get an email from me with the three things that I've been devouring to optimize my life and business. It might include hacks, tips, experiments, resources, books, podcasts, and more, all to help you get more unrestricted. It's totally free and you can unsubscribe at any time. So go ahead and sign up at athenasimpson.com newsletter.